Good morning, Trinity. Good morning. Glad, to, glad to see everybody here. Uh, you can see we've got a, a new choir to uh, start us off this morning. And a uh, uh, brief announcement, this is Mama Sally's birthday. And so... Happy birthday! Happy birthday! <laughs> and as she likes to remind me every year, three months, in three months exactly, it'll be Christmas Day. So... <laughs> And this so, is my three quarters of a century day. So. Oh, yes. wow. but I won't comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad to see everybody here, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, starting off with Jesus Loves Me instead of the first hymn that's listed there. So uh, let me uh, pray over us, and uh, then stand, please, and we'll get started with the hymns. Dear Lord, we are so thankful for the, the exuberance that we see with these children and the excitement that they bring to, to our service. And they're uh, looking forward to, to singing the praises for Jesus Christ as, as we are. Uh, help us to uh, be in a worshipful, worshipful pro, pro, uh, pose as we listen to the, the word today. Help, let it sink into our hearts and our minds. And Lord, we, we thank you so much for this church and for what it means to all of us and for the weather, the beautiful weather that you are giving us, uh, the fall weather. Thank you, Lord, for your, your graciousness to us and for your son who means so much to us and in whose name we pray. Amen. Okay. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so, little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. you down. <laughs> the second hymn is 460. And we're going to sing, let me get my glasses on. We'll sing one, two, and four. Hymn number 460. Well, that's not right. That's all right. We'll start with that. He leadeth me, O blessed thought, O words with heavenly comfort fraught. Whate'er I do, where'er I be, Still tis God's hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, By his own hand he leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, For by his hand he leadeth me. Sometimes mid scenes of deepest gloom, sometimes where Eden's bowers bloom, by water still or troubled sea, still tis God's hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hand he leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. And when my task on earth is done, when by thy grace the victory's won, in death's cold wave I will not flee, since God through Jordan leadeth me. 
Next one will be 538. And again, we'll sing one, three, and four. I love to tell the story. <clears throat> I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story because I know it is true. It satisfies my longings as nothing else can do. I love to tell the story. Twill be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story to pleasant. Did I skip one? You didn't start out right. Oh, okay. We'll start I love, love to tell the story to pleasant to repeat. What seems is time I tell it More wonderfully sweet I love to tell a story For some have never heard The message of salvation From God's own holy word I love to tell the story, twill be my theme in glory, to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story for those who know it best. Sing hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. And when in scenes of glory I sing the new, new song, twill be the old, old story that I have loved so long. I love to tell the story, twill be my theme in glory, to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. We'll have to fire the piano player. All right, good morning. Today's reading is from Isaiah 53. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, and we have turned everyone, or we have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. 
He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth, by oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had not done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Let us pray. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for giving us that prophecy in Isaiah 53, Lord. Today, I pray that as we go through the word today, that, that we will see your amazing works, that we will hear it in many different ways, but know that you are the one true God and that you sent Jesus Christ to us for our salvation. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good to see everybody. Uh, it is a joyful thing again to be able to gather and uh, see brothers and sisters here, uh, some we hadn't seen in a little bit. Welcome, Lily. And uh, it's so good to have you here. Um, Elizabeth, Ken, uh, uh, Marquesa, your hat is beautiful. I love your new hat. Um, let us uh, just start, though. I, I do want to start with just a moment of prayer for our um, our sister Robbie and brother. Uh, sorry, sister Tara and brother Robbie, uh, but specifically for Terry's, Tara's mother Phyllis, who, um, who's going through some health challenges right now. So I'd like to just take a moment for her to call on him for uh, for her sake. Um, Lord, we um, we we thank you for this this time and space and location and opportunity to be. Um, to be gathered in your in your under your name, uh, you tell us that where one or more are gathered, there you are. So we know and always have faith that you're with us, um, Lord. I, I ask, when we collectively uh, ask for our sister uh, Phyllis to uh, experience peace and healing today, um, a peace of mind, peace in her body, relief from uh, from any type of pain, and um, uh, peace to rest in you. Lord, we uh, also ask that you be with our sister Tara and brother Robbie and, and, uh, and Phyllis's husband Edwin today and just continue to walk with them and make your presence known. We ask all these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, so we have a couple of other things, a couple of other quick announcements. Um, I mean, we, we do want to acknowledge um, um, the passing of uh, Mike's grandmother, Gertrude, who passed on, uh, on the 22nd, I guess that would be Friday, um, or Thursday, is it Thursday or Friday? Thursday night, Friday, um, somewhere in there. Um, we do want to recognize uh, Gertrude and just, just, uh, just take a moment to remember her. Um, she uh, passed away at the age of 93 uh, and was, uh, had a, you know, for what the little bit of no, I know, a, a very interesting story. She was married to a, a gentleman named James, um, but her parents immigrated to Buffalo from Germany and uh, became American citizens. Uh, Gert, as she was known, uh, was had a known for had had a fondness for German food and culture. Uh, she had five children. She was known as a loving uh, homemaker and mom and uh, enjoyed spending time with her grandchildren, one of which was our, our brother Mike, 
uh, when they were growing up, and, and, it, and her obituary mentioned that she loved to take, take them to movies and lunch, um, and that she never met a stranger, and that no doubt um, that she's chatting up angels in heaven. So she'll be greatly missed. Uh, we just want to call and, and just um, remember her, remember her life. I mean, that she gave, uh, she gave gifts of time and presence with, uh, with Mike, and uh, I know Aletha as well. And uh, we just ask that her life uh, be one that points people uh, to him and when they remember her. Um, but we also have a couple birthdays that this week. Uh, obviously, uh, we mentioned uh, Sally's, but also Lily. Lily, I know you had a birthday this week, so happy birthday. Um, and uh, so glad that you're here and able to celebrate that. Uh, that, is a, that is a joyful thing. Um, and we were certainly happy to be able to wish Mama Sally a, 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 a birthday uh, message this morning, and I know the children already sang to her. Uh, so there'll be more, more on that. Um, but I will say that as we were going through uh, the first letter of John here, uh, it, it, there felt, and I think Mike would probably agree, there's a little bit of a lighter weight in some level than what we did, were dealing with in Second Peter, where it was a lot of fire versus uh, the concept and conversation around false teachers. Uh, and so there's the, the letter of First John is, is really meant to, uh, to bring joy at some level. I mean, it's, that's kind of like, hear these truths. And remember, as we talked about, this is coming from John, the Apostle John. This is the John that's been there from, uh, from seeing Jesus get called you know, forth and be baptized uh, by um, John the Baptist, all the way to, uh, to where he is right now, probably in his 80s, 90s. And as we mentioned, he's, he's kind of like, I'm, I've got the resume. I don't have time for anything else. I'm just going to hit you with the truth. Like, here's the truth. And what he does, as we mentioned in this letter, is he hits us with the truth and then provides us with these tests over and over again. He hits us with the truth, provides you with a test of that truth, how you know that truth impacts your life. Um, but, and so at some level, it, it, when, we were, when I was, we were looking at the first letter of John, it's like, wow, this is going to be like, it's, it's at some level lighter um, but I will tell you, and I'll share that as I came into contact with chapter two here, uh, is that I, I definitely felt this moment of woeful, like lack of qualification, um, lack of ability, lack of, uh, of, of, of the ability to teach this because there is literally, we could be here for in this six verses for the rest of the year and we could just stay here. It's, it's so powerful. There's so much in this verse today that it is, it is so much absolutely reality-shattering impl implications that we could, we could be here all day, we could be here all year just on this verse. Um, he's giving, John is giving us another massive truth to collide with us. But if you realize what John has given us via the Holy Spirit from nearly... 2,000 years ago, all the way to today, and Sally's birthday. It is a truth that will collide with your fear, with your anxiety, with your guilt, with your shame, and replace it with joy. There could be no better birthday present for your birthday week or birthday day. And that joy, though, it's not one thing to have joy. It's another thing to have what happens as a result of joy. And that joy will produce action. It'll produce, it is a truth that will create joyful action. But before we get into that, I have a question. What do speeding tickets and azalea bushes have in common? Speeding tickets and azalea bushes. Now, does everyone here know what an azalea bush is? Because maybe I don't know if they have those in Buffalo. No? Yes? No? Eh? Just get a little bit. I'm watching, looking at Aletha. She's like, eh. Elizabeth, you know what azalea is? Okay, it's fair. It's, it's okay. It's a southern thing. Okay, I'm going to introduce you to azalea bushes. They're like, there, you, there's some around in the neighborhood. I'm sure if you drove around, you'd find some. Azalea bushes are these, are these little bushes that uh, I'll, I'll explain more about these in just a second. It's okay if you don't know about it. Don't feel bad. Um, I, at some level, I kind of wish I knew less about them, but the, the, uh, the, 
the thing that I, the, 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 both of these things, and specifically these are speeding tickets, are small town speeding tickets, um, which are different than what you might experience here in Dallas. Um, the, the thing that both of these have in common is that my dad, J.Q. Davis, has intimate knowledge of both of them, and as a result of his intimate knowledge of both of these things, small town speeding tickets and azalea bushes, and their characteristics, I do too. So I, it's just a little bit of background. I grew up in a very small town in North Louisiana called Cachada, about 2,000 people. And with a town of that size, it's one of those where kind of, it's like Mayberry, like everybody kind of knows everybody, right? So uh, my dad has been an attorney in Cachada for over, I, I believe over 50 years. I didn't do all the exact math, but like 50 years. He's been a small town attorney there. And um, so, he knows something about the speeding tickets that have that happened there, and so did so did I as a teenager, <laughs> and so did many people in our town. Why, why are you looking at Lily, John? <laughs> she never had a speeding ticket. Okay. Uh, here's the thing with these small towns: is that small towns are full of lonely roads, right? There's these long rural stretches where, as a teenager, you are put behind the wheel of a car at 15, which is crazy to think about today, but you're put behind the wheel of a car at 15, and, and then there's this little temptation of, oh, I wonder if I, how fast it could go, and then you go, and you realize the only person else out there is the policeman that knows the teenagers do that, and next thing you know, you got a speeding ticket. Um, but then the, there's the fact that you're in a small town, and you know people. Specifically, you know an attorney who works with the judge, and so there's this thing called, you know, get your ticket fixed. <laughs> or you take your ticket and fortunately your dad, or if you, somebody, you know somebody, or if you, you know the attorney, you can go, hey, Mr. JQ, would you, could you maybe get this taken care of? Oh, yeah, you know, I'll talk to John and, and we'll, you know, he's going he's gonna to go be at court later this week and we'll talk to the clerk and, you know, don't worry about it, right? That kind of thing happens all over the place in small towns. I actually had a friend of mine, uh, um, uh, Emma, Emma, if you ever hear this, you'll know, you'll know the stories about you. She's from Los Angeles. She grew up in England, lives in Los Angeles. She came to, came to Cachada, and Jamie, who you all know, got a speeding ticket and literally talked his way out of the speeding ticket because the, the state trooper was like his brother-in-law or something, her cousin. And she, her mind was blown that you could talk your way out of a ticket. Like, he, he was clearly breaking the law and, and talked his way out. So she was, she was blown away by this. But, it's, but at the, the point here is, is that like the, speedy, the speeding tickets mean that you broke the law. And there must be some type of payment. And frankly, these small towns make a lot of their revenue off of speeding tickets. That's why you have speed traps, right? There must be some type of payment for your transgression. But if you have an advocate, if you have an attorney, they can do something for you. Um, and that's what my dad would do for a lot of people, including myself. We're going to talk more about that um, because we also have, I mean, an advocate, and we've got two attorneys in the room, uh, which is amazing. Um, an attorney, the word attorney comes from the French term meaning one appointed to or constituted. Um, their words original meaning is a, a person acting for another as an agent or deputy. So in other words, someone is saying, I'm representing this person. But then the second part of that is an advocate. And the advocate is someone who speaks in defense of. A person who speaks or writes in support of or defense of a person, cause, or so forth. Uh, the definition also includes the word intercessor, someone who intercedes for you. And Fortunately, my dad always interceded for me when it came to tickets. He also interceded for a lot of people, and he's been interceding for people for a long time, as I'm sure both the attorneys in the room have interceded and been attorneys, as in they represented, and they acted, they interceded, they pleaded the case to the, the justice of the law to say, hey, uh, I'm in defense of this person. We have an advocate, as John will reveal to us and remind us of. Now, azalea bushes. How is that connected? Okay, here's the thing you need to know about azalea bushes. They are a pain. They're beautiful when they bloom. 
Uh, but they are, they were, and my dad loved them, and he planted them everywhere. And we had them in our yard and around all over the farm and everywhere. And I spent probably 77% of my childhood moving a hose between azalea plants to make sure these things were watered, because if they didn't get enough water, they died. They were also very susceptible to rapid changes in temperature. So if a freeze came, they would, especially if it was one where the temperature dropped rapidly, they would all be wiped out. So all your planting and watering for a whole year, gone. Um, which made me kind of hate azaleas. <laughs> Still get triggered when I see them. Oh, azalea plant. Um, <laughs> but my dad loved them for whatever reason. He loved them. He loved when they went, because when they would all bloom all at the same time across the farm or the yard, they would be beautiful. But when that freeze was coming, um, you had to cover them. That was the way you saved them, is you covered them. You'd put something over them, a bag, a bucket, or I mean, we would spend, uh, there was all this in, ingenuity that came out of, we gotta save the azaleas, okay, so we go out and put buckets and bags and like all kinds of different contraptions to try to, you'd look out at our yard and it would be like all these things over all these bushes and it was, it was insanity. Um, it was covered, they were covered, to be covered from the freeze that was coming that had no mercy and did not care about the plants that it encountered. Um, I specifically remember a time, I actually looked it up, it was in 1983, there was like one of the coldest times in Louisiana history and it just, everything got wiped out. Like, everything got wiped out. Um, and the azaleas would die unless you covered them. What we're gonna to learn today is that there is a covering for us. There has been a covering for us. There is an unyielding, it's not a freeze, an unyielding fire of wrath that is coming, that is being withheld right now. Uh, God's justice and order will be consummated. Uh, and if you don't have a covering, you've got a problem. Um, but today, we're going to be reminded of this fact that we do have a covering. We don't have to fear the freeze. Uh, as a believer in Christ, you have a qualified advocate. It's one thing to have, you know, um, an advocate. It's another thing to have a qualified advocate. And we're talking about why our advocate is uniquely qualified. And he is actively at work for you and we will acknowledge the fact that you've been given a covering from wrath that will, from a wrath that will eventually and suddenly come. And this knowledge, this hard truth that John delivers to us today can only result in one thing, joyful action. Joyful action. And your joyful action, as we will find, is your proof of your salvation. Let's pray and we're going to get into the word. Lord, thank you for this letter from John that you have given us. Thank you for that day, that moment where the Holy Spirit moved him. And he spoke these words, had these words written down, got them onto some parchment, and sent them out. And through what can only be called a miracle, here we are, over 2,000 years later, or nearly 2,000 years later, reading your word, and, uh, and we see the, the, the fact that your word will not be stopped. Uh, Lord, let, it, let your word speak to us. Let there be ears open and eyes open. Uh, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, if we turn in, in the first letter of John to chapter 2, is where we're going to be today. Um, we see that, as we mentioned, John is delivering another truth. And he also delivers, alongside this truth, some tests of this truth. Uh, I'm gonna, we're going to get a little bit of a running start of this. We're going to go back to um, uh, uh, verse 5. Uh, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we have fellowship with him... While we walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice truth. But if we walk in the light, 
as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. And then John brings this. In John uh, chapter 2, 1 through 6. My little children, I am willing, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, but not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. And by this, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this, we, we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. So uh, we see a lot of things here, but right out of the, right out of the, right out of the gate, I want to acknowledge this, my, this, this my little children. Here's what you need to know. Regardless of where you are in your walk, in your calling, it's okay. If you're called, you're called. If you're called and you have 50 years of walking after you've been called, wonderful. If you've got five minutes, wonderful. Little children. He's, this, is, this is John, who's the, like the veteran, 90, I still think 93 years, 93 years old, let's say. And he's looking at these, you know, he's, he, in his mind, he's thinking about maybe those believers that have been at the, these churches across Asia um, for 30 years. Maybe he's thinking about somebody he met that's a new one. And he's saying, little children, I'm not writing these things so that you may sin. Basically, I'm saying, look, I'm, I'm not writing these things. It's, it's almost like he's like, like I'm going to break this down for you because I don't want you to misunderstand and think because you're a little child Christian, a little, little bitty bitty Christian, that this means you can go and sin because you have this grace. He's saying, I'm not saying, I'm not writing these so that you have a license. Just because you have an attorney doesn't mean you get to be a criminal, right? That's, you, like, you can have a great attorney, but that doesn't, you shouldn't look at that and go, oh, well, then I can get away with more. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, uh, I'm saying, I'm telling you this uh, so that you will uh, recognize this truth, that when you sin, you have an advocate with the Father. Um, That has a lot in it, this advocate with the Father. He is, uh, that advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, but not for ours only, but also for the whole world. So you've got an advocate, um, and he's reminding them of this point. And he's pointed to the, the need to tell the truth and confess your sins. If you confess, then you know, like, that's your, don't lie to your lawyer, basically. Don't lie to your lawyer, as I'm sure Ken and John can, can say. It's hard to help somebody that's lying to you. If you confess your sins, you know who your lawyer is. It's one thing to say there's a lawyer over there, but just because you know there's a lawyer over there doesn't mean he's your lawyer. He's not necessarily your representative just because he's over there. How do you know? Well, that's what he gives us. But before we get into the, the test, we have to talk about this, this idea of 
um, the advocate and propitiation because it is because of the propitiation that he is a qualified advocate. Now, what is propitiation? Propitiation is a strange word. It's not something you're going to encounter in, you know, at Starbucks or on a, you know, your daily conversations. Propitiation is an act of appeasing. Um, it is to atone, to substitute, to, um, to, to make whole, right? Uh, and what, we ha what that has to take us back to is the fact that, as we've studied, God is a God of order and perfect justice. He is always in integrity with his word. He, um, sin must be dealt with. Sin is never not dealt with. Every sin, will, there will be payment for every sin. For some, they will pay for their sin in hell. Others, their sin will be paid for or is paid for by Jesus Christ, the only qualified advocate. That's the only way. That's the only two things. But the sin will be paid for. The sin will be paid for. And because uh, if it's not, then God isn't in integrity with himself. And we're not really, like, it doesn't work. So that we know that there must be atonement. Now, if you wanted to do, like, a, a, a tiny sketch of this, and you'd say, well, like, there's always been this idea of sacrificial atonement, right, from the Old Testament. God said, sacrifice these things. In fact, if you go back to the uh, Genesis 3, there was a, a blood sacrifice for Adam and Eve. How did they get their clothing? There was animals killed. It says made out of animal skins. So Adam and Eve sinned. There's an atonement for them where there was some type of sacrifice that God made to give them the skin. Somebody died. It's this idea that there must be a blood sacrifice, a death. There's some kind of, that's, and then that, that's carried through the Old Testament where there's all these rituals and, and there's, there's all these blood sacrifices and guilt offerings. And as you heard in Isaiah talked about a guilt offering, like there's all of these things where there would be blood sprinkled. The thing to know is that all of that was pointing forward. All of that was not like those sprinkles of blood during in the tabernacle didn't atone for the sin. They pointed people to there will be a blood sacrifice that will do it. It's one, there will be one blood sacrifice that will do it all. And, I'm gonna, and, and those simply were shadows of what was coming. They, you could say God was holding back his wrath at that time. He still is. He still is. We all have, there's still grace right now in the fact that we're breathing air. We're alive. His wrath is held back. Um. But all of that, that, that like, and you, but you could see that there were, you know, it was you know, a sacrifice, a thousand bulls, a thousand of this. There's all these things to try to, it was just a reminder of the, that we, they, Israel, that none of us can do it. There's no way. There's no way. Um, but then there was one way. Uh, you know, in this conversation of, of, of uh, propitiation, commentary from John MacArthur said, this is a theological term. This is a gospel truth. This is a principle that God, that states God's wrath must be placated, and that is at the core of salvation. That's not particularly popular today, not even among today, many, among, among many who call themselves Christians, to think that God for them, uh, to, to think of God for them is to simply to think of God of love, not of a God of wrath and fury and vengeance and anger. But that is only part of God's nature. He is a God of punishment. If he didn't feel that way, if he, if he wasn't angry about sin, he wouldn't be perfectly holy. So the punishment of sin, which is the just penalty for violating God's holy law, and the pardon for sin, which is the gracious forgiveness of God's grace, have to come together. As uh, Pastor Mike Fabara, who uh, was a uh, Compass Bible Church used to say, you can't have the good news without the bad news. So there is this need for a, an atonement, and that is what happens in Jesus' life on the cross. A man completely sinless, the only sacrifice that could pay for it. 
and the only one ever necessary. But that makes him the only qualified advocate. He's the only qualified attorney. He's the only one that can step into the Father and say, Lord, forgive them. They know not what they do. I will take it. I will bear the sins. I will be pierced, as we heard in the, in the reading from Isaiah. And he was, and he did. So, uh, and then one, I guess one more point on this. There is this point here that talks about uh, he is the propitiation for our sins, but not ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Um, he's, he's not the lawyer to everybody. This is, not, this is a tough thing to swallow, but it's what the word says. Um, what John's saying here is he's, he's, he's implicating, hey, um, he's the propitiation for your, our sins, us and you who we have fellowship with. He's an advocate for us. Uh, you know, me and you and the church is reading this, but also for others that you don't know. That's the whole world. Does it mean every single person in the world? No, it doesn't. How do we know that? It's what Jesus said. In John 17, in the high priestly prayer, which we're going to refer to a couple other times here, which is where Jesus is speaking and praying for us, giving us an example of what intercessory prayer looks like, he says the following, I have manifested your name, this is him praying, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Think of this as Jesus speaking to the Father. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and they come to know and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. Listen to this. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. Those you have given me, they are yours. All are mine, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Um, if he was the attorney for everyone, there would be nobody in hell. But we know there will be those in hell. Um, so it's an important thing to recognize because in realizing that, if you know him, it should shake you to the core that he's called you out of death. Because if you know him, if you have been moved by him at all, even as a little children, a little child, He's your advocate. And you've been called out of darkness. Lazarus, get up. Did you have anything to do with it? Not at all. We'll talk more about that here shortly. So he's not the advocate for any, everyone, but he is the advocate for, for those that who? How do you know? That's the, here, here comes the test. He's, he's telling you, hey, you have this advocate. He's the propitiation for all sins. You have this advocate. How do you know that he's yours? He's your advocate. Two ways that he gives us. Keeping his commandments and walking how he walked. And we're going to examine both of those things. Uh, but before, before we get to those two things, um, there, is, there is this other thing. Um, and I, I want to share this because I saw this recently in, uh, in, in the baptism, baptism of a brother and I'm watching his journey. Um, there is... By, he says, and, and John says, and by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments, and whoever keeps his word, and whoever walks in the same way he walks. And then there's this other thing, as, as uh, Mike taught last week, there's this, you know, this, uh, the verse that says, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. There's this walking in the light. 
and what you should be able to feel and what you no doubt do feel is the, is the polarity of walking where you once walked in the dark and now you walk in the light. I can feel that for myself if I think back to who I was and what I felt after my mom passed away. Absolute rebellion, absolute rejection of God because my mom wasn't saved by him from her cancer. Um, there was darkness, darkness for a decade. But then something shifted. I met Susanna, God sent, sent, sent her as a, a messenger and she said, famous words to me, if you want to date me, you gotta to come to church. I said, okay, you're beautiful, I'll do whatever you say. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, I'm thankful for that every, every day because I deserved, I did not deserve, that is like, talk about grace. I should have been being picked up out of a ditch, not being like invited by a beautiful, kind-hearted woman to come to church and hear the word. And then what happened was I heard the word for the first time, and then things started to change. And then this, the, 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 the walk in the light started. But what does it feel like to walk in the light? What does it feel like? How do you know? Here's some things from, a, a, again, Pastor Mike Fabara is a Compass Bible Church. I've got to give him credit uh, from a lesson he taught. But I'm going to share with you some of the points he shared. How do you, what are the, what are the, and this is, how do you know that you've been called forth? And again, it's how do you know, not as how does somebody else know. Not what you say happen, not what you show, but how you know. And here's 10 ways. One is, you feel a sense of a cleaned conscience. Guilt and shame from the past will feel lifted. And again, this isn't something that, sometimes it happens all at once, sometimes it's, it takes years. God has a different way of a plan of this. He's, he says little children, little children suggest that they will grow up. They will grow. We all grow in sanctification. Certainly, when I first met Susanna and went to church one time, I didn't all of a sudden feel li this lifted. Now, was I called at that time? Yes, absolutely. Was I called 13 years before when I was rebelling against God? Yes. I was still Jesus' then. But then, then there's this call. Then there's this like Lazarus come out and it starts. You will feel a sense of a clean conscience. All guilt and shame from the past will feel lifted. Hebrews 9, 14. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? It doesn't mean we have a totally clear conscience, but we feel lifted and we feel convicted where before we never thought about it. We were okay to do evil. We were okay to do whatever we thought was right in our own eyes. And we didn't, like, that's cool. I'm going to do whatever I think. Number two, you will have a serious conviction of sin. It means that, like, you feel sin now. You might have, before, in darkness, you might have committed sin all the time, and made a practice of it, and maybe you didn't feel it. But now you feel it. When you lie, you feel it. When you have a harsh word, you feel it. When you have a wandering eye, you feel it. You feel a conviction, a serious conviction for sin. 1 Thessalonians, uh, 1 Thessalonians, first chapter, verses 3 through 5 says, Remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope, in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word but also in power and in the Holy Spirit with what? With full conviction. You know what kind of men we prove to be among your sect. This full conviction. It's a conviction. And you may not like it and you may try to hide from it but you can't get away from it. 
Number three, you will feel a sense that the problem that you had before like was made right. You feel, the, you feel that the weight that maybe I didn't realize I was carrying my whole life, you feel like somehow that is not my weight anymore. You feel like, like you've been covered by that, that azalea bush has been covered by something. Isaiah 1, uh, 118 says, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, you shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. You'll feel that those, this, you can look back and go, I did horrible things. And yet I don't feel, I feel that they're covered. I don't feel the wrath that is due me. Instead, I feel something different. And in feeling that something different, number four, you will submit to your future to God's direction. Inside of that, you go, wait a minute, I was covered. The freeze came, and I didn't get wiped out. And I'm not going to get wiped out. I'm going to grow the way the one who covered me says to grow. <laughs> Isaiah 6, 5 through 8 says, I, And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips. I, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. And my, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. This is Isaiah seeing God and going, I can't, like, I can't, I've, I'm dead. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be burned up in the, in the frost, in the freeze. I'm going to be burned up in this fire. I'm going to be burned up. And then one of the seraphim flew to me, ha having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken from the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt has been taken away and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And then I said, Here I am. Send me. I'm going to be burned up in the freeze. No, you're not. I've got you. I'm going to atone for this. Oh, yeah, with a what? A burning coal to your lips. Probably going to hurt. But your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. Then send me wherever you want me to go because I should have been destroyed. You'll have, you'll have a, a desire to submit your future to God's direction. Number five, you'll have an inner sense of assurance, not dependent on outside things, inside. An inner, sen inner sense of assurance. In Romans, it says, For we did not receive a spirit of slavery to f fall back into fear, but we have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Like It's just an assurance. It's a recognition, and, a, and, and oftentimes that doesn't happen. You have to keep working on that, leaning into that assurance that you are in the hand of the shepherd. And then you can go look at all the suffering and chaos in the world, and in my life, and fear, and anxiety, and all these things. But let me remind myself that I am secure. Number six, you'll experience an undeniable redirection in your life. Patterns change. There's a change in the actual spirit of the man or woman. It says in uh, the first letter of John here in chapter three, he says, Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the de devil. No one born of God makes a practice, that's a key thing, a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. Uh, there, is, there, is a, there is a undeniable shift in patterns. The things that you once counted totally acceptable, you will not count as acceptable anymore. Or if you go that path, you feel completely indicted. You're like, I've got to repent. Um, and you don't make, the key thing is there you make a practice. There might have been practices in your life that were sinful, and you did them over and over and over again, and it was just part of your, the way you operated. It was just your operating system. Here that operating system starts to get pulled out. Number seven, you hate sin more than ever. Every sin will convict you and grieve you, and there will be a desperate eagerness to cleanse yourself of sin. Again, not all of these happen at once, little children. 
but I certainly have felt that. I have felt that by virtue of you know finding my, my, myself, Mike, all, finding ourselves in this church, and 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 then having to come here and teach. Uh, Fear and trembling. Fear and trembling to come up here and teach the Word of God. Put the, let the Word of God come through my mouth. I'm terrified of having sin lingering. So, you know, it's a on my knees, you know, and prayers from the brothers and people here. It, it's, it's, it is a, a searching for where is that sin and asking for forgiveness. Um, other things, final, number eight, you will feel, after this call for, you will feel increasingly alienated from the world. You will feel a dissonance from the people at your business, the people in the sorority, the people in the, in the whatever, the people you see on the news. You will feel this dissonance between the world and them. There will be this alienation. John 15, 19 says, if you were of the world, if you were of the world, the world would love you. As, it is, as its own, but because you are not of the world, but I cho- chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. When the world starts hating you, probably a sign. It's going to get more difficult for you in the world um, the closer you get to him. But, number nine, you don't really care. You don't care that the world or the culture hates you. What God thinks trumps what the world thinks. Uh, Galatians 6.14 says, But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by, by which the world has been crucified in me. I don't care what they say at work. I don't care what they say at the sorority or college. I don't care what they say, what the clients say. I don't care. I'm not going to not acknowledge this. I'm not going to not walk in the way I know to be righteous. 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 4, 3 through 4 says, But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. This is Paul talking. In fact, I do not even judge myself. For if I were not aware of anything against myself... For I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. I am not worried about being judged by man. I'm not even going to judge myself. Jesus judges me. Lord judges me. The end. Number 10. Uh, You will never turn away from him. You will never turn on Jesus Christ and his true true, true church. Not a church. It's a building and people, but the true church, the brothers and sisters in Christ that are in him with you as a result of connection through the Holy Spirit. You will never turn on Jesus Christ. All the others called and all the others and and all the other brothers and sisters. Someone who has truly been called forth, they never become an apostate who turns on and attacks Jesus Christ. Hebrews Chapter 3, 13 13 through 14. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold, hold our original confidence firm to the end. Um, total, you could do a whole sermon on that idea, but... Um, if you find yourself with this knowledge and you find yourself attacking or, or attacking the word or attacking Jesus or the authority, repent. I don't see anybody here, but if you hear this message, repent. Stop. There is a wrath coming for you that is eternal, it is dark, it is pain that we can't even put into words. Repent at the feet of Jesus. This is what, who did this though? It doesn't mean that you're gone. Paul did this. But what did Jesus say? Paul, why are you, why are, why are you coming after me and my people? It's not too late. There's no too late.
That's on that. So number one, how do we know? There is a feeling, and you might be able to connect. As you think about what I just said, some of those 10 things, you can feel that. You might not feel all 10. I certainly didn't feel all 10 like right, out, right, out of the, right at the beginning. And it's been 10 years, 13 years of a progression through that. And I've seen, some of, I've seen people that I know um, literally go through you know, having a few of these to having another one now. But last two weeks ago, I saw a man, dear friend of mine, come, go from not seeing his sin to absolutely being convicted of it and then choosing to be obedient and be baptized. That's undeniable. That is a miracle. Here's what you need to know. If you are feeling any of those things, that is not you. That's the Holy Spirit working in you. What are the other tests? By this you, we will know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. We keep, the, 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 uh, the Greek there means to do. It doesn't mean we just know his commandments, we do them. Well, what were Jesus' commandments? Well, uh, I'm going to read a few of the 38 <laughs> that we could choose from, from the Gospels. Uh, just some simple ones. And if I feel inspired, I might just do all 38. So hang tight. What are some of, <laughs> what are some of the commandments? He says, so if you know me, if, if, and he says, if you love me, you will follow my commandments. And by this we know, we've come to know him, we will keep his commandments. Well, we should have a thirst to wanting to know what his commandments are. Okay, be in the word. Study what Jesus said. Go, you, know, you have a hunger for that. Okay, well, let me boil it down for you. Here's some of the things that were commandments from Jesus from the four Gospels. When you stand praying, forgive. Forgive. Forgive others. You must be born again. Do not be, he says, do not be surprised at me saying, you must be born, born again. You will be born again. It's not something you do. It's just you got called. You don't have anything to do with anything to do, anything more to do with the fact you are moved and being a believer in him than, the, than you did when you were, you were being born. Or Lazarus had to do with him getting called out of the tomb. You must be born again. Uh, number three, remain in me and I will remain in you. He says, remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain on the vine, in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. So stay in him. Let your light shine before men. You don't hide the fact that you have been called forth. Settle, matter, settle matters quickly with your adversary. This is more, there's so much, there's a lot of, by the way, for our attorneys in the room, there's a lot of legal stuff in the Bible. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. <laughs> Do it while you are still with him on the way, or he may hand you over to the judge. Um, get rid of whatever causes you sin. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. Do not swear at all. Do not resist an evil person. That is, turn the other cheek. Uh, give more than is being demanded. Love your enemies. Give to please God, not to be seen by men. Pray privately, not to be seen by men. Pray for the Father's will, not your own. Fast without fanfare. Whenever you fast, don't be like the hypocrites, as he says, show the, I know I'm fasting. You're not trying to show anything to anybody. It's not about, as we'll see, your test of your, uh, the test of you belonging to him is not what you say or not what others see on the outside. Do not store up treasures on earth. Matthew 6, 19 through 21, do not store up, store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust can destroy. But store up yourselves treasures in heaven. That means we don't focus on treasures here. We recognize we're in, a, in, a, in, a, in an eternal game. Don't worry about your needs. Don't worry about tomorrow. Place God first. Like There's verses on all of these. Don't judge. Guard what is sacred. Ask, seek, and knock. Care for those in distress. Enter through the narrow gate. The way to follow me is not going to be easy. It's narrow. Watch out for false prophets. Many will come, as we learned in, in uh, 2 Peter. Uh, do not despise childlike believers. 
those new ones that may not understand everything. It's okay, little children. He says, see that you do not look down, this is the NIV, do not look down on one of those little ones. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. Do not look down on one of these little ones. Isn't that beautiful? Do not exalt yourself. Settle disputes between believers. He shows how, how to you know, settle disputes by taking, uh, if your brother sins against you, go to, go to him only. And then if he doesn't listen, go to two or, two or more. And if he doesn't listen, go before the church. Um, do not oppose other Christians. Where the man comes and says, there's a man de- driving out demons in your name. Should we, should we say something? You know, he's not one of us. And he says, don't stop him. No one who does a miracle in my name can in the, in the next moment say anything bad about me for whoever is not against us is for us. Have complete faith in God. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. I tell you the truth. If anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself in the sea and, do, and does not doubt in his heart but believes that, it, that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Love one another. My commandment is this. Love one another as I have loved you. Do this in remembrance of me. He took bread and gave thanks and broke it, just as we're going to uh, celebrate here shortly. It's a commandment. That's why we do it. You should wash each other's feet as a servant. Not that, not that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, but you should also wash one another's feet. You should be thinking about how can I serve my brother and sister. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. You must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour you do not expect him, so be ready. And finally, if you love me, you will obey what I command. There's a high-level sketch of the commandments of Jesus. We know those things. If we know those things and we follow those things and those are things that guide our lives, then we know. If I say I know him and I, don't, I ignore all the things that Jesus commands, then you're a liar. Number three, he says you ought to walk like Jesus walked. Well, how did Jesus walk? A quick sketch here. How did Jesus walk? Jesus walked in total obedience and total submission to the will of the Father. Luke chapter 22, verse 42, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will. Jesus resisted and defeated all temptation. In his weakest moments, tempted in the desert after 40 days of fasting, what did he do? He leaned on the word of God. Then then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after 40 days, fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. But the tempter came and said to him, "If If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. And he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And then the devil took him to a holy city and set him on a pinnacle and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus said back to him, Again it is written, You shall not put your Lord to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms and glory of the world. And he said to him, All these I'll give to you if you fall down and worship me. And then Jesus said, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and and him only shall you serve. And the devil left him, and behold, Angels came and were ministering to him. How did Jesus walk? Obviously, no idols. Totally defeating temptation and yet experiencing it. Complete compassion for others and love. I think of the man uh, in Matthew 8, the man at the pool, and the, or the leper, to both, both examples, but there's the, there's the leper that Jesus heals, who Jesus... If you think about this moment, that leper had probably not, who knows when the last time he had human contact. And that Jesus walked up to him, the, the dirtiest, most filthy, um, rejected person. 
Jesus walked right up to him and made him clean. He said, when Jesus saw him, and then, and then same thing for the man at the, at the pool who was crippled and paralyzed. He had been there for 38 years. Jesus saw this man lying there, and he'd been there for a long time, and he said to him, do you want to be healed? And the sick man said, sir, I have no one to put me in the pool where the water is stirred up, and while I'm going to step, and when I'm going to go there, somebody jumps in front of me, steps down before me. And Jesus said, get up, take your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took his bed and walked. Jesus cared. How did he walk? How did Jesus walk? He cared for his flock. He fed them when they were hungry, in some cases with bread and fish, and other times it was, but it was always with the word. He operated as a servant leader in a, an incredible show of humility, the king of the universe taking his robe off to wash the feet of those, even one who would betray him. How else did he walk? He spent time alone with God. One of my favorite verses, Mark 1, 35. Early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up and slipped out to a solitary place to pray. He prayed. He spent time alone with God. He, his perfect love cast out the fear that no doubt he was feeling um, come upon, could come upon him when considering the fate that was coming the next day after the Last Supper. He rebuked false teaching. He warned about sin and hell. He never worried about money. He never thought on things that were wicked or evil. He knew the word, the scriptures. Obviously, he had an advantage in that. Uh, but he studied them, even as a child. He prayed for and forgave his enemies. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Consider that. He's interceding for them, and he's forgiving them in the same breath, just as he does for us. And he taught and he fed others. So, so in a nutshell, we ought to walk how he walked. How did he walk? With action, 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 action. Who do I see this in? As an example, um, we have a sister that walks in the light, Sally. So the reason Ron and Sally are here, or where it started, was COVID. COVID's happening, and they come to visit because what else are we going to do? <laughs> they come over to visit. OK, come over. Well, kids are here. We're not in school, all that. So they come to visit, and they stay for a week, and they're getting ready to go. And I'm like, ah, oh, this is great having you guys here. Like, well, stay for another week. So they stay for another week. But one of the things that the, the, the gifts from that is I got to live with Ron and Sally for two weeks. And specifically, I got to observe the way Sally walks. And it's appropriate to honor her on her birthday today. How does she walk? Here's some of her characteristics that you may not know. She, she intentionally spends time with God every day. When? You want to know what's going on at 5 a.m. with Sally? She's in the Word. She's in the Word. I'd wake up 4.30, I'm going to go to my workout or something, walk into the living room, lights are already on. Where's Sally? She's right there in the Word. In the Word and reading it, and next to it, her journal and writing. She's doing exactly Mark, uh, the verse in Mark, rising very early, very early in the morning. Not kind of early, not late in the morning, very early in the morning. When? While it was still dark. Jesus departed and went out to a desolate place where, she, where he prayed. Sally does the same thing. Maybe not a desolate place, except the living room when nobody else is there. It's kind of desolate, as in by herself. She delights in the word of God. She's seeking to feed on that every single day. Jeremiah 15, 16 says, Your words were found and I ate them, and your words became for me a joy and the delight of my heart, for I have been called by your name, O Lord of hosts. Have you guys, I know you've all felt this, where, and Ken, I mean, I, I, like, we, we have this thing, we go in the word every day, right? 
if you go in the word every day, you feel what happens when the oxygen mask is taken away for a minute. You guys feel this? Like when you don't study, you're not in the word for a few days, you feel the, the <sighs> she delights in the word. And next to her Bible was this journal, as we've been doing, Mike's been keeping on, uh, on Wednesday nights, a journal of all the people she's interceding for, praying intercessory for. Some people say, oh, a spiritual, she's a spiritual prayer warrior. She's, she's every morning doing that. How else does she walk? If you know Sally, you would say, I think everyone would agree, she exemplifies uh, 1 Peter 3, uh, verse 4. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable, imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is, in God's sight, very precious. That's the description of uh, a godly woman with a gentle and quiet spirit, which is, and, and I, I mean, I, that's what I see in her. I also see a woman who, um, the next verse, submits to her husband as she does for Christ. For this, we, th this is how the holy women who hoped in God hoped in God, used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham and called him Lord, and are your her children, if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Um, she exemplifies that. And Ron, I don't, what's the, how many years of marriage? 50, 54 years of marriage. Um, she's, she's one that walks the, these things. She knows, I can speak, for, I'm sure I can speak for her. She knows herself who her shepherd is and who she belongs to. But her light is cast everywhere else. And appropriately, what is she doing right now on her birthday? She's down the hall teaching children the word of God. Um, so we are thankful for her. The point here is, is that when you walk how he walks, and you obey his commandments, and you make the, you've been called for your light, the light through you shines to others. And that's what was happening to me when I was walking in at 4.30 a.m. There's Mama Sally with the, with the Bible. It is indeed a joyful thing to be in the hand of the shepherd. So my question for you is, do you find yourself moved by the word? Do you find yourself reading the word and moved by it? call to action? Do you find yourself seeking his commandments? Do you find yourself seeking to find out how he walked and then walk how he walked or try? Know this, that's, as I mentioned earlier, that's not your doing. That's the Holy Spirit working in you. you and so you can let go of, if I could only do this, perfect. The Holy Spirit's working in you. Otherwise, your eyes would be blind to it. Your ears would be closed. The Holy Spirit's working. You don't have to question um, one commentary said the following on this topic. Since faith is in infinitely beyond all the power of our unregenerated human nature, it is only God who can give the spiritual ears to hear and the eyes to see the beauty of Christ in the gospel. God alone disarms the hostility of the sinner, turning his heart of stone to a heart of flesh. So the problem of conversion is not with the word of God or God's law, but with man's prideful heart. The humility required to submit to the gospel, which is beyond man's natural capacity, is therefore not prompted by man's will, but by God's mercy. To be clear, you have nothing to do with your choice. You were chosen. Since no one can believe the gospel unless God grants it, the Spirit must likewise give all his people spiritual life and understanding in their hearts, to be open and thus respond to Christ in faith. But simply, we believe that the scriptures, what the, what the scriptures say about our pre-regenerate sinful state and its implications, that we are dead in our trespasses and sins, and we are therefore unable to seek God, please God, or come to God, and thus we need the regeneration of the Holy Spirit to enable us to believe in Christ for our salvation. 
So are you being moved or have you been moved? And if you can say, I've been moved, I can point to it. And then it is a joyful thing. And if you feel yourself, you may not feel, you may still feel weight, you may still feel guilt, you may still feel shame, you may still feel all these things, but if you have been moved at all, recognize that you're being called and, and answer the call. I love this verse as we close. John 10, 14, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and listen to this, my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold, but I, and I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay, my, lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I, ha I lay it down on my own accord, and I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. He is our shepherd. The next verse, I don't have it in front of me right now, but it says that we are in his hand, and no one can snatch a sheep out of his hand. No matter, you can't. There's no, like... If you belong to him, you belong to him. There's not a thing you can do about it. And you will come to him. It might be at 93. It might be at 9. It might be at 3. Well, it's just you are, you are his the whole time. It's just a matter of when you've been woken up. And if you felt yourself moved by any of these things, if you've ever felt yourself desiring his commandments, desiring to walk as he walks, desiring to worship him, that's a joyful thing. In fact, the question would be is, if you know that, what joyful action must you take today? In fact, the hymn that was sung earlier alluded to this. The hymn said, I love to tell the story of Jesus and his love. I would have you consider that if you feel, if you've been hit with this truth, if you've been moved, if you've been called to follow his commandments and walk like him, you have something to do. In Mark 5, 19, Jesus has just healed the man of terrible affliction and demonic presence. And what does he tell him to do? As he was getting in the boat, the man who had been possessed by demons begged him to go with, begged to go with him, but Jesus would not allow him. He said, go home to your own people. And he said, listen to this, tell them how much the Lord has done for you and what mercy he has shown you. Tell them how much the Lord has done for you and what mercy he has shown you. If, you. if Jesus is your advocate, your qualified advocate, you have been shown mercy that is beyond any comprehension. It should that produce a joyful desire of movement to, at the minimum, tell others how much the Lord has done for you and what his mercy has shown you. What did the man do? The man went away and began to proclaim throughout the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him and what everyone was amazed. So if this is new to you, what will you do to investigate this push, this movement, this drawing, this calling a little bit further? And if you're feeling resistance, here's a question. What must you surrender or what must and, 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 and what and where must you choose to surrender. And if you try to do it yourself, you're going to fail. You've got to ask for his help on that. Lord, help my unbelief. Let's pray. Lord, uh, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you are the qualified, the only qualified advocate for us, and, and that you, you suffered for us, that that may be true, that, you've, that we are covered from the wrath that is due to us, and that you even now intercede for us. And we know that when we call on you, when we ask, when we um, knock, you always answer. Uh, let us not move away from your commandments and show us how to walk as you would walk. Give us the Holy Spirit-driven discernment and desire and strength and power necessary to make the choice that is not our choice but your choice. 
and to find joy in it, even when it, the world would say it, it is going to create struggle and hardship, we know that what the world says is a lie. And we know that your word is always truth. Lord, I ask for your blessing on the brothers and sisters that are here, these children, and those that are not here today, but those who hear this message today or sometime in the future, that your word may pierce their heart and show them that there is a path with the most qualified advocate. We ask all these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Uh, thank you for uh, the word today, Brian, uh, for being a faithful servant. Um, submitting to God's leading and God's message for us today. Um, as Brian was just speaking, we all have areas of in, our, in our lives, and as John wrote in this letter and those verses that were in our passage today, as I just reread those first couple, um, he wrote what he wrote, alluding to the previous passage, 5 to 10, which Brian alluded back to that we discussed last week, um, that, um, that we may walk in the light, if we're in the light that we walk that way, that we may not sin, but um, if and when, which is also implied, we do sin, we have a qualified advocate, we have Jesus that pleads on our behalf by his own work and qualification, not ours, that we would be covered like the azaleas Brian referred to, that he loves oh so dearly, um, that we would be covered that we are not destroyed because we are covered not by our own work, the bushes don't cover themselves, but by Jesus' work and Jesus' blood. Um, and as Brian asked the questions, where... Where is the resistance in your life? Where are the areas that you're not letting him in, that you're not handing over, um, that it's been very clear to you, the Spirit is pushing on you, saying, that's your spot at this point in your sanctification. This is the thing you're refusing to let me in on. You're trying to hold on to and keep to yourself. Got to release that and let the Spirit come in and take it. Um, it's surgery, as Scripture is very clear on. It's a surgical process, and we've heard that before, and Scripture talks about it, um, but it, it kind of hit me this week, and then again right now during the sermon as I was listening. Um, how many of us ever really think through that image and that word picture that Scripture gives us of surgery? It's not pretty, it's messy, it's painful. The only reason modern surgery is not painful is because of the anesthesia and drugs that by the grace of God have been gifted to us. Um, but it wasn't always that way. Um, surgery is painful and messy and ugly, but the result is healing and betterment for our benefit. Um, so as we do every week, ask the Spirit to show you um, where is he pressing that you're trying to ignore and keep in the dark. Because those things, as we've also talked about, as Brian brings up as well, uh, those are the things that are hindering your relationship with the Father and with all of those around you. Um, so pull it out, however painful it may be. Rip it to the surface. Let the Spirit pull it out and deal with it. Let Jesus' blood cover it. Um, ask forgiveness if you need to be forgiven. 
give forgiveness if you need to give forgiveness, regardless of what the response is. That's what we're called to. Um, so let's take a moment, um, invite the Spirit to show us those areas in ourselves, uh, hand those things over. Um, if you're watching right now or in the future, I invite you at home, if you are a believer, if you belong to Christ, um, grab some bread or a cracker, uh, some juice, uh, wine if you want, not a glass, just a little. Uh, and join us as a, a family of believers as we take part in this together. Um, so take some time to do that, and then I'll pray for us, and we will uh, take part in the Lord's Supper together. Father, we come before you this morning in the power of the Spirit and covered by the blood and work of Christ. Uh, we are thankful and worshipful that we have the ability by those means to come into your throne room, to approach you um, in an awestruck and trembling fashion, but at the same time as your children that you long to be in fellowship with. Lord, I pray that you would do that work in each one of us, um, that the surgery, however painful or ugly, that needs to take part, uh, that you would continue to convict by the Spirit what those things are. And Lord, I pray for myself and for my brothers and sisters that you would push through the Spirit, that you would work, that you would shine the light on those things um, and in a loving way because it is better for us and glorifying to you that no matter how difficult or painful any of that process or those things may be, um, that you push the Spirit conviction so hard and so strongly that they cannot be ignored. As you were told in the Old Testament, one of your prophets at one point said that he would no longer speak of your word, but that it burned like a fire inside his bones until he couldn't stay quiet any longer. Lord, we pray that kind of drive and conviction on the sin in our life, that as we try to ignore promptings of the Spirit, that it burns so strongly like a fire in our bones that we cannot ignore it. We thank you for the sacrifice of Christ on the cross for our behalf and everything that that means and all that comes along with it. We thank you that we are your children, that we belong to your family, and all of the love and grace and goodness that comes along with that. And Father, we pray to you now as Jesus taught us our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. And as Paul wrote in 
his letter to the Corinthians in his first letter. He said, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. And we're going to sing Redeemed. That's uh, hymn number 520. We'll sing all three verses. Proclaim it redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed through his infinite mercy, his child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed how I love to proclaim it, his child and forever I am. Redeemed and so happy in Jesus, no language my rapture can tell. I know that the light of his presence with me doth continually dwell. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it, his child and forever I am. I think of my blessed Redeemer, I think of him all the day long. I sing, for I cannot be silent, his love is the theme of my song. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it, his child and forever I am. Thank you, Sally. Ron, Victory Choir with the, uh, the new additions this morning. Um, let's see, Sephora, uh, Marquesa, Aurora, your voices were beautiful. I love that we were uh, expand, always expanding Victory Choir. Uh, let us pray. Lord, thank you for uh, this day. Thank you for the time that we were able to spend together. Uh, thank you for all these brothers and sisters, these children here. Let us go into the week. Uh, renewed uh, in power with the joy of the truth that we know that we have you as the eternal advocate for us and that we are in your hand. Let us uh, move into the week with uh, anxiety fleeing from us, uh, certainty in you, and joy and love between each other. In your son Jesus' name, amen.